Aloha mai kako. Uh, greetings to you all. We are happy to bring to you all another Aloha Friday live. This one is special. They all are. But this one is really special because we actually have Sister Becca from TNC joining us. We're uh, kind of going to tag team this like we've done before in the past in uh, probably many presentations now throughout the year. So I'm so happy to welcome and be alongside Becca with uh, TNC. So everyone, aloha mai e Becca. Aloha kule, aloha everybody. Thank you guys. This is really fun. I really appreciate the invitation to join you kule. It's, it's like we're at the fish pond together teaching the kids. Um, the only thing is I can't see everybody, but it's um, great to be here and just happy Friday, Aloha Friday to all of you. Indeed, um, so true, right? So we're um, coming to you all at our home, from our homes, but um, I also wanna say and extend an Aloha May Day, Lay Day in Hawaii. Uh, gosh, here we are May 1st and um, just continue to look at these things. I was texting a great tita of ours, uh, Pualani, who took a, a picture and sent it to us of her spread of flowers as she was gonna be engaging in lay making as she had her morning coffee. So that was um, a beautiful visual of May Day is Lay Day in Hawaii. So we're actually gonna get started as we have in the past. This uh, kilo, however, is going to be a little different. We made it, um, as we probably always try to do, tie into our theme, which is our pono mo'ono, looking at pono practices, sustainable fisheries, um, our actions, uh, the choices that we have that certainly uh, apply to sustainability directly. So our hoa aina, lehua kamaka, uh, is not live in the ocean right now, but she was live <laughs> in the ocean uh, a couple of days ago. And she is actually taking us through a, through a little underwater exploration and um, thank you so much to Nahaku who had uh, put Lehua's footage into this video for us to enjoy. And it was really just, you know, at that time she got into the ocean, whatever we see, we see, and we just went with it. It kind of takes uh, those of us who are not too ma'a or not too often do we get into the underwater world. Uh, Lehua affords us an opportunity uh, to do that through this kilo of this Aloha Friday Live as she um, she takes us alongside her in one of her dives. She's somewhere in Kiholo, place, um, you know, just somewhere along the shoreline is where Lehua found herself. So um, just know that we are in the Ahupua'a, Pu'ua'awa. We are somewhere along the Kiholo coast. Yes, no disclosure of her exact location, but that she is under the kai. So I think with that, unless Becca, um, I'm not sure. I know Nahaku did a fabulous job and um, uh, putting some music to it. So perhaps Sister Becca, you might want to narrate for us. I'm not sure, or we'll just go with the video. So here we go for our uh, kilo with our lovely hoa aina lehua.
Again, mahalo so much to cousin Lehua for that. Um, Becca, you, I know you were, uh, what do you call, 
not translating, but um, narrating. <laughs> narrating. Yep, thank you. Narrating kind of as the video went, but definitely nice to see uh, for me on my end. I know I could see some manini. I think there was ama ama opaihuna for sure, uh, honu, um, and then those other ia along the uh, on the rocks themselves, the hauke uke opihi. Uh, anyway, those nice communities of ia that we were able to see through Lehua's video. But there were also some, I think you said in the beginning, were those Pua Ama? Yeah, it looked like a school of Pua Ama, which is the early stage, the fingerlings, um, like four, six inches long. That's what it looked like to me. It's hard to see with um, fresh water, but uh, yeah, they were swimming in their shape, looked like Pua Ama, the baby stage of the striped mullet, the prize fish for the king. Beautiful. Well, mahalo. So that's our kilo for the day. Oh, my goodness. Someone just walked into my door. Not someone, but um, a special someone. Someone who, uh, who did our video. So, oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Lehua. <laughs> yeah. oh, oh, lovely. Plumeria. Oh, thanks, Dad. Look at who is here. Lehua, we got to get you um, uh, some kind of, uh, no. Anyway, oh my gosh. So beautiful. Aala, aala no ke ya pua melia. Lei pua melia. Mahalo piha. Mahalo, mahalo. We're just going to dive in. So Lehua will join us and be, um. wait, let me, we're going to share a chair here. Come, come. <laughs> Sorry, you guys. Chinese being live. Yeah. <laughs> Love it. Oh, yeah. We can share this um this chair over here. You're right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I'm good. Thanks. Um, to kind of kick off our uh presentation part of it, what you see on your screen is a, a banner that we had made, Becca and I, in 2015. We dove into a project. It was a collaboration project, and um, uh, we really wanted to do. The gist of it was to do interviews, and so I had taken that Puleana to interview as many fishermen as I could. Um, as you see on our poster there, there are three generations. I wanted to make sure. Or I did make sure that within. Uh, the pool of people that I had interviewed, I made sure that I had young adults. Most of them had, uh, the younger men I had interviewed were probably in their early 20s. Then I had folks probably in my, my age range, kind of makua, mid, mid age. And then I had kupuna. I made sure that we had, um, most of the kupuna I had interviewed were 70 years and older. So we wanted to make sure that we had uh, these generations represented. What made it to our poster was basically my um, going through the material and the, the interviews themselves and extracting out really the common themes, right, as, as we would. What was mentioned by everyone uh, in their way, through their words, uh, their expressions, uh, nevertheless, this is what had made it to our poster. You actually do see the KTA logo on there. It was yet another collaboration with our community here in Waimea uh, that uh, Colin Mira, who's the manager here at our KTA in our community of Waimea, uh, this poster hangs in the store, particularly in the fish department or seafood department, I guess, not fish department, seafood department. So if you're ever in KTA Waimea, try to take a look. It's hanging up there by the, in the seafood department of KTA. Uh, nevertheless, some of the things that we wanted to convey forward was um, these five points that kind of helped us. Um, some of them, most of them, if anything, I think, are, are very a common thread throughout any community, no matter what island you are, what Kayawulu or community you come from, I believe these uh, hold true to each one of our particular vahi, our places, our um, aina aloha, our beloved lands, the lands that we love and belong to and malama. So one of the things had to do with kilo, always to be kilo, pay attention. That was actually a kind of a direct quote 
Uh, most of the kupuna, pay attention, pay attention. You know how they would they say to us, pay attention. Um, observe, know your places, know the seasons. Hele amaa. That that's one of the things, right? That word maa to become used to, accustomed to. For many people, um, we belong to a place for many generations. So the mana, uh, the maa of place perhaps is inherent for some. And um, je, uh, a pasta, a succession, we ma'a to our place because our daddy ma'a, because grandpa ma'a, because the uncles ma'a, uh, those sorts of things. And then there are folks who become ma'a, right? To ho'o ma'a, ho'o ma'a ma'a, to, to become accustomed and used to, to a place. But that was one of the common themes of everyone is know your place. Know your place. You're going, know where for go, when not for go, you're going to see the tendencies of perhaps those people who belong to that place and, and their actions, their, the way they uh, conduct themselves. And, and so if we're, we're new to a place or coming into a place, I think it would behoove us to not look to, to the local, to the natives, to the people who to really ma'a to that place for us ourselves to become then, if we're not already, ma'a to our particular place. Another common theme that was high on the, the list of what everybody had said was to malama ina kupuna. And, and sometimes it, it didn't necessarily refer to age because there were some people who expressed um, giving to people whether they were kupuna or not, but were, weren't able to access the beach any longer for, for whatever reason it may be. But it was about sharing the catch. And you know that maybe you know, brother across the road or auntie up there really loves this particular fish you have, you go take to them. You share your catch with Ohana, with friends and family. Um, yes, of course, to Malama da Pupuna. That, of course, was first and foremost, but, but I just want to say, right, that it wasn't exclusively that you only take to, to Kupuna. Sometimes, you know, there's a, a mama who just, Hanau, she just gave birth to, to a child and and the ohana is in that right now and so no time to hele kahakai to holo holo um so go take some ia to to mommy and baby and the ohana there so that was really really important for the folks that we had interviewed again uh, i believe what i'm speaking is not new it's not new information it's actually perhaps quite old and very tucked within the cultural ways of our kanaka. Uh, so uh, um, moving on, another thing that was mentioned certainly by, by our folks was um, take only what you need. Uh, one of our uncles kept saying, even if the fish biting, what are you gonna keep doing? Keep fishing, keep fishing. Even if the fish biting, keep fishing. It had to do with self-regulation. That was really the gist of what they were saying. We have the ability to choose. We have the ability to self-regulate. And the question is, do we? Do we? Do you? Take only what you need. Some of the interviewees talked about eating fresh. Um, that you only would take, they're talking about back in the day, in the 50s, 60s, they only take maybe um, what they call their ekemau or their, um, what you call, not grass bag, but um, burlap bag maybe. Uh, of some rice, some coffee, everything else they, they catch and they eat. They catch for breakfast, they catch for dinner, and um, and eating fresh, not for the freezer. That the fish could be out in the ocean, perhaps spawning, swimming, populating, reproducing, as opposed to laying in your freezer. So that was one of the things that was very evident was catch for your table, not for your freezer. Then uh, kind of along the lines of what people were saying about the pay attention, it was about um, honoring that knowledge, that knowledge of, of people of place and, and listening to my husband, you know, relay some um, recall of his time growing up and whatnot. There was a particular uncle of Waipio and this uncle and, and maybe I will say the Ohana name to honor them. It was the Escaran Ohana of Waipio and my husband Kanaina had the honor and privilege of knowing Uncle Olu Eskaran. Some of you might have known Uncle or the Ohana, but that Uncle would say to Kanaina folks when they were little boys, he and his brothers, look what everybody else is doing. Can tell they're not ma'a to the place. Uh, but they were again privileged to be 
alongside someone who is a native of Waipio, who is um, Uncle Olu. And, uh, and I think that was it, that honoring of, um, of place-based knowledge. So we, we look to our people of Milo'i and we honor them and their knowledge and Ho'okena and Ha'ena and keep all of these beautiful communities. Hey, hey, I mean, the list goes on and on and on every place just to honor the knowledge of, of every place and the ohana associated with those places um, to elevate their knowledge, their ike kupuna, their ancestral knowledge that have been just passed to, to the generations, to us. Um, who have who acquired right the, the uh, succession pieces, um, but sharing also teach what you know, teach what you know. That was also a very common thread and theme throughout the interviewees is teach what you know, teach the moopuna what you know, teach the nephew what you know. Uh, so honoring of knowledge, and then finally uh, in the interview. The, the Kane, yes, they were all Kane, and I, I should redo this and go interview Wahine as well. There are certainly Fisher ladies um, out there, but they were talking about having a variety in catch. And this one, I'm actually gonna talk about just briefly about my father's interview when I had interviewed my dad again, this was back in 2015. So some years have passed, but um, my dad is gonna talk about the transporting. When he was uh, a young man, he comes back from Vietnam. And again, Kiholo was our beach, right? Kiholo within the Ahupua of Puuaawa'a, we live Puuanahulu. Our dad comes back from Vietnam and still kind of at that time. And, and even when he was younger, his teenage years, the transportation of, or transporting, if you will, uh, uh, of fish from Kiholo to home for Uwanahulu was via donkeys. And these were trained, tame donkeys. They had name, one's name was Lula, and um, oh, there were two others, but sorry, I'm only remembering Lula right now. But my dad talks about uh, him and his cousins throwing net, you know, catching Ia, and, and in a, a packed box, uh, a box, they would, um, or cracker cans sometimes, they would line the fish. Like they, he would talk about one, um, I actually am looking at his, his interview. They would pack like a layer of manini and they would set down on top of the manini a whole layer of um, milo leaf. And then they would put a layer of maiko and then they would put um, milo leaf. And then they would kind of layer um, you know, fish, milo leaf, fish, milo leaf, fish, milo leaf, and um, close up the box, secure it on the donkey, and they would actually send the donkey on its way. It would make its way from Kiholo on the trail all the way to home Fu'uanahulu. And, you know, I'm not exactly sure how perhaps they communicated to grandma. I do know that there was like a crank phone that they could call up to what they call the ranch headquarters. So maybe a message was driven down to my grandmother to go meet the donkey at the Pu'uloa trailhead. And sure enough, would you not know Lula, the donkey arrived at the, the trailhead. Grandma was there to retrieve the box of Ia from Kiholo, but there was a variety in catch is what they were saying, you know, not just only target one, one, one um, species, but rather perhaps have an ono for a little bit of this and just a little bit of that. And in it, it said not just to, to look at the different um, ia, but also ranges in size. And they're saying, make sure that you, you throw back, throw back the, the babies, throw back the big mamas, don't take those. Dad, I've heard him say it a lot, even as recent as uh, this past week, pan size, what he called pan size, that they can fry. That that was the, that, that fits in the frying pan, I suppose is, is what he meant by that. But a variety in catch and a variety of sizes, throwing back the babies and throwing back the big mamas. Oh, so um, that's kind of my little um, sharing or kind of brief, um, summarization, if you will, of this project that we had done that we did call Ponomo Ono, and that when you retrieve things from the ocean, from the kai, when you go to retrieve food, 
from from that that feeds you, which is the kai, that you have a tendency, we hope, to malama that which feeds you. There should be this reciprocal, right, reciprocity, kinds of relationship actions. I take care of you, you take care of me, of course, with no expectation. But, you know, you look at that. Does the sea expect us? Does the kai expect you to, to care for it? Ah, well, maybe not. But there are some of us that do believe that within the relationship, there is a, it's expectation free, but that's just how it is. I going malama, the ocean that malama me. I'm going to care for this forest that cares for me. So this reciprocity is, is, um, is a part of our lives, very evident, but not because it's one that's based on expectation, uh, that I expect this ocean to provide for me. And, and that, um, uh, nevertheless, I think I'm just gonna close this with a quote from my dad where he said, you use, you malama. I think it's just very clear. You use, you malama. And um, with that, I'm gonna tag it right over to Sister Becca and um, we'll continue on with our presentation so far, our Ponomo Ono uh, project. Eyala, eyala, eyala. Thank you, Kule. Well said. Uh, it was a pleasure making this poster with you. I think these principles are just, they are Pono, they are the right thing to do. And I'm glad it's hanging at KTA and sharing this message more broadly. Um, and so real quick, I just want to, introduce myself um, for those of you that um, haven't met me. I, I'm not sure how many people I've gotten to meet that are on the call, but my name's Rebecca. Um, and I'm trying to advance the slide, but it doesn't seem to be working. So I might ask Nahaku to advance it. Oh, maybe it worked. Uh, thanks, Nahaku. So my name's Rebecca Most. I work um, on Hawaii Island right now. I'm up at my home office in North Kohala in the town of Kapa'au. And I've been working for the Nature Conservancy for about eight years. I'm currently the program manager for our Hawaii Island Marine Program. And throughout my career with the Nature Conservancy, and even a little bit before, um, I've had the distinct pleasure of spending lots of time at Kiholo with Kuole and the Ohana there. Um, with the Nature Conservancy, we actually were gifted a private property on the north end of Kiholo Bay at Kaloko Kiholo by Angus Mitchell. And so we have been working at that local ia, that fish pond, for about eight years now, restoring it alongside Hui Aloha Kiholo, our partners. Um, and it's just been this really beautiful relationship and collaboration to Malama that place together. Um, so we're going to be talking about Ponomo Ono, and um, just as Kule was just sharing in her description of those themes during her interviews with fishermen, um, a lot of what I'm going to be kind of going a little deeper on is, is one specific topic, uh, which is slot sizes in fisheries biology. The scientists like to call this concept of limiting your catch slot sizes, but it's really back to what Kule was saying about limiting our, your really thinking about our choices and um, really assessing what we need versus what we want and taking that time to really check in with ourselves when we are consuming um, in terms of what we need and what we want. So I really think that this is like a really well-timed theme. I know that throughout this last month or two, we've all been thinking about our choices. And I don't know about you, but I have thought a lot about what's in my refrigerator and what's in my cupboards. I've been planting my garden and my yard. Um, and so when we're talking about fishing, those choices also apply. And the, the choices we're making today really translate into the security into the future. Um, we're also talking about community a lot, right? At Kiholo, we work with an amazing community that have been stewarding this place for generations. Um, and when we say the word community or community-based management, a lot of the themes that we talk about, you know, often the first thing that comes to your mind is usually humans. But for this discussion, I really wanted to expand that. 
when we were looking at that video at the beginning of the presentation that Lehua shared, when I was looking at those scenes of beautiful baby fish, I include that in community. When I'm looking at the hauke uke on the rocks, I include that in the community. I include the limu, the corals, all of it is part of the community that we depend on. And so um, just a suggestion to expand your, your community to include all of the fish in the sea, the forests, the plants, the insects. And when we start to think about our community in that way, it really helps influence those choices that we're making. So I wanted to go a little bit deeper on what we're calling slot sizes. You could also talk about this in terms of like the Goldilocks choice in the sense that not too big, not too small. But in this picture that's on the screen right now is a beautiful school of a hole hole, a fish that we see frequently near the shoreline. Um, and these look like juveniles to me. They're like mid-size range, maybe pan frying size, like Kuale was talking about. Um, right at that early stage where they're starting to get a little bit bigger, but they're not quite full-size adults yet. Um, when I first started learning about fisheries biology in school, one of the things that was really impactful for me was the length of time that fish can actually live. So we have collected a lot of data on the lifespan of fish across the entire Pacific. And as people catch big fish, there's ways that you can date a fish. There's ways to know how old it is. And it's just mind blowing that some of the fish that we're seeing every day can live this long. I had no idea when I first started studying on the reef that fish could live this long. So if you're looking at the slide right now, I hope you can see the number of years. And then we have some fish that you commonly see here in Hawaii along this scale. So on the low end of the scale, we have hee, they reproduce or they um, live only for a year and a half. And so they're reproducing really frequently and their lifespan is very short. And fisheries biologists aren't actually um, that concerned on their abundance because their, their lifespan is so short and they're producing so many young that it's, um, their population is doing really well. But when you look at fish that live a long time, it can actually be really easy to wipe out a population really quickly. So moving up the scale, we see Manini can live over four years old, Moy are seven years, Uhu are nine years. And those are cool, those are exciting, but when I look at the far end of the scale, that's where my mind is blown. Um, we thought Kala could live for 30 years, but just recently somebody caught a Kala that's the unicorn fish, a surgeon fish. And it had um, indication that it was 58 years old. And that is amazing. So for a kala, a fish that you know usually you see on the reef that's about this size, can live 58 years old is remarkable. And even Lao Ipala, our beautiful yellow tanks, can live up to 35 years old. And those guys only get about this big. So it really shifted my thinking when I think of our community of fish on the reef in terms of like their lifespan and how many years that represents in terms of the young that they can reproduce and their knowledge of their reef and their habits and their behavior. And um, I think of it just like, you know, there's kapuna fish that are teaching the young fish how to eat, how to live, how to avoid predators. And so it really shifted my thinking when I understood the lifespan of the fish. Um, there's one fish I want to point out on here. There's an anai. Anai is the large stage of the ama ama fish. Um, we saw the pua amas in the video, and then when they're a little bit longer, maybe like eight inches, we call them amas. And then when they get pan frying size, like 11, 12 inches long, we call them ama ama. And then when they get really large, at the very like end of their lifespan, we call them anais. So those ones can live up to 16 years. So you may be asking yourself, how do you know how long a fish lives for? So fish have this bone inside of their head that's called an otolith. It's an ear bone and it's really similar to our middle ear and it functions in the same way. The otolith bone inside of a fish's head 
is actually what helps um, their balance and like understand which direction to swim. So the otolith bone, just like the rings on a tree, actually lays down a layer every year. Those layers are made out of calcium carbonate and protein. When it's opaque, it's like that white layer that you see in the picture. That's when it's growing really fast. Oh, I'm sorry, I got it backwards. When it's opaque, it's growing slower. And then when it's transparent, it's growing really fast, which makes sense because it's growing so fast that otolith bone is growing and um, not laying down as much calcium carbonate. So from the otolith bone, you can actually age a fish. So you can see the distinct layers in this bone. This is from an ama ama or striped mullet, the prized fish of the ali'i in the fish ponds. And in this picture, this fish was five years old with those different layers. So that is how scientists look at the lifespan of a fish. If somebody catches a very large fish, you can actually give an otolith to a scientist. They look at it under a microscope. They'll count the rings on the otolith and they'll understand how old the fish is. So now I wanna go a little bit deeper on ama ama. It's the fish that I know and love the most um, at our work at the Nature Conservancy property with Hui Aloha Kiholo. We've been restoring this beautiful historic fish pond called Loko Okiholo. And Ama Ama are one of our prized fish. It was the reason that people created fish ponds was to grow these fish um, for the ali'i. And the Ama Ama have this really amazing life cycle. So I wanted to go a little deeper on the life cycle of Ama Ama. And I wanted to really like put yourself in the mindset of an ama ama. So for a moment, if you can just imagine what it's like to be a fish, all this talk of fish, my cat has decided to come and start meowing next to me. <laughs> Sorry if you can hear that in the background. Um, so the ama ama, when they're adults, they'll live in the fish pond, they're graze the algae, eat the phytoplankton, dig in the mud and look for algae to eat. And when they decide that they're ready to make some babies, they get together in a big school. Fisheries biologists call this a mass spawning aggregation. So a big school of ama ama will come to the entrance of the fish pond where we have our beautiful awai or channel. And ama ama like to make babies out in the deep ocean. So traditionally a fish pond would have a makaha. A makaha is a sluice gate, it's a vertical gate with spaces in between where the baby fish can get in, but the big fish can't get out. Historically at Kaloko Okihola, there used to be two makaha. And this was just a genius method because during spawning season, all of the ama ama are congregating at the makaha and there would be a caretaker, a, a kia'i that would know the seasons of spawning. And at those two makaha, one at the mouth of the pond and one towards the end at the ocean, the kiai could raise the first makaha and all of the um, ama ama would come into the channel. And it made it so easy to harvest sustainably. So one uncle from Oahu described to me during the harvest that you would, you would throw a net, you would collect the fish in the channel during their spawning season and you would give some of those fish would be an offering for the mo'o, the mo'o wahine, the guardian spirits of the pond, to honor them, honor the akua. There would also be the largest fish in the school would be released, released to go spawn, released to be the next generation, to build in sustainability into the harvest. And then what you would consume would be like the mid-range fish that was left over. And so that double gate system really allowed for a lot of control and a lot of um, choices being made when they were harvesting. Okay, so back to being an ama ama. You were released and you were let out of the fish pond and you go out into the deep blue water. And that is where they would release their eggs and their sperm into the water column. But they would go really far offshore. Some of the papers I've read that have tagged and tracked ama ama, they go 50 miles offshore. So really out there into the deep ocean currents. Um, those eggs and sperm, the eggs get fertilized and the eggs actually have like a yolk sac, just like a chicken egg, and it's floating around buoyant in the water column. 
as it metamorphosizes, it becomes what we call a larval fish. A larval fish look really weird. They don't even have scales yet. They're usually see-through. Often they don't even have a, eyes or a mouth as they're feeding off of that yolk sac and kind of being transported on the currents around the island. But then over about a month period, they start to change. They grow eyes, they grow a mouth, scales start to form, and they become a full juvenile fish at about 28 days, which is exactly a lunar month, which is pretty cool. During that time, they need to find their way home. So the juvenile fish actually move back towards the reef, actively swimming against the current. And what's amazing is that they can find it. They use the otolith bone that we were just talking about to like direct themselves because that helps them with balance and direction. Um, but they also listen. They listen for the sounds of the reef. If you've ever been free diving out on the reef, you hear that rice crispy sound, like rice, you know, the cereal, that snapping sound. That's actually a snapping shrimp chewing coral on the reef. So the pua amas, the little baby mullets, will move all the way back to the reef and they um, listen for the reef. And then I've been told that they smell the sweet, fresh water coming out of the ponds and make their way back home. So, Nohako, if you want to switch to the next slide. I have pictures of the kuama going through the entire larval phase. So when they have their yolk sac in the first top left picture, it doesn't even have eyes or a mouth. Then they're growing and that yolk sac is decreasing. And then in the early stages, they're less than a centimeter. They're tiny, tiny little larval fish. And they move all the way up to about like a um, 11 millimeter um, fish that has scales and eyes and a mouth. So. If you want to go to the next slide, we've actually been studying these fish at the fish pond for a number of years. And we've done some net casts in our beautiful Awai. And Barbara, who I think is on the call, one of our team members, has been looking at the spawning season of Ama Ama. So in the top left picture, you can see an Ama Ama's eggs that was um, ready to spawn this February. And then in the bottom left big picture, you can see one of the little baby ama amas that we caught coming back into the awai in our nets um, a number of years ago when we were looking at the spawning season. So this spawning study is helping us understand the cycles of fish and um, has been a really useful for us to like develop a sustainable harvest plan. So the whole point of this story is I wanted you to understand the struggles of a baby fish and how much they go through those big mamas going out to the open ocean and coming and then the 28 days out at sea and having to find their homes again it is a lot of work and ama ama don't actually start reproducing until between one year old and three year old so now that we know the struggles of the baby fish the message is in slot sizes when we're talking about slot sizes is Let's give those babies some time to grow. Let's give them time to start reproducing so that their genetics can feed the next generation. And by allowing the fish to get large enough, pan size, as Uncle Sonny says, you're giving that next generation a head start. Um, without them being able to reproduce, you can actually wipe out a population really quickly. So that's the baby story of a slot size, but there's also another story which is um, that big mamas make more babies. So the big fish, the big anise in this example, the way fisheries biologists define what that size is, is we call them prime spawners. So prime spawners is 70% or more of the max size. So Kumalesha holding up an omilu, that's a big, gigantic prime spawner for its size. I think that one's 26 inches long, um, cut to scale, which is awesome. And the prime spawners are really amazing because they actually produce exponentially more eggs than the ones that are in the mid-range. So a prime spawner or a big mama that we like to call them is producing exponentially more eggs. And then when they look at those eggs, it has way more yolk. So it has more food reserve for the baby, which then translates into the babies being larger and stronger when they become, they move from larval stages to juvenile stages. So, and then they survive, they have a greater chance of survival because they're larger. So big mamas make exponentially more babies 
their babies end up being stronger because they have more food because the eggs are bigger. And so you get way more fish from one big mama than you do from the smaller sized fish. So that's why when we talk about slot sizes and in these concepts of pono mo ono, we say to throw the babies back and that the big maybe big mamas make more babies. And so when you're making your choices, it's really about choosing that mid-range pan-sized fish. For ama ama, that range is 11 to 19 inches. So those are the perfect fish to catch is an 11 to 19 inch fish which actually perfectly fits a pan. So Uncle Sonny was spot on. Um, and that was the concept I wanted to go a little bit deeper um, and explore with you guys. I, I hope you enjoyed that. I hope you now can picture the life of an ama ama um, as it moves out of the alwai and spawns and those baby fish move back to shore. Uh, their spawning season is December through March. So we just finished up spawning season. And right now what we call recruitment season is when all those babies are coming back into the fish pond. We've been seeing so many babies along the shoreline. We saw it in the video this morning. And every time I visit the local IA, um, it's one of my favorite times of year is recruitment season because baby fish are pretty cute. So with that, I'm going to pass it back over to Kule, if you're ready, Kule. And she was going to demonstrate one more point for the end of our talk story today. Mahalo nui, Becca. I think that's a, a really great way of um, kind of highlighting the collaboration with your folks' work, um, the work of scientists and the data that you're able to retrieve really helps our understanding, helps um, help us know so much more in depth. And um, I'm appreciative for that. So you were just uh, one inch off. Uh, this was, this is a 27 inch. No, we're all good. I, I know we had 26 in our uh, our thoughts earlier too, but this, ia, this mama omilu, is uh, again, Becca already talked about the ability to age Ia and find out what their age is. So an Omilu that's this size, 27 inches, she's uh, a six year old. So literally this is to scale. This is, uh, I am holding up a 27 inch Omilu mama that's six years old. What you see behind me, my backdrop, uh, thanks to my daughters helping me put this up, what you're actually seeing is 86. I don't know if, if, um, if you can see all of it, but this whole backdrop here, I have hanging 86 two-year-old Omilu. And again, they are to scale and these, um, these two-year-olds are 14 inches. They are to scale. They're exactly 14 inches. But this was to give us uh, a visual. Um, and if uh, there was a way to kind of span it all, I think you have a good idea because the entire backdrop is all of these omilu. But the, the message that Becca and I, and if you're, you, your children, your mo'opuna maybe, or you yourself, came to Kiholo, you would have engaged in this activity. We use this at outreach so folks can literally see what 86 two-year-old 14-inch Omilu look like. And the message is this mama, this six-year-old 27-inch Omilu makes more babies than all of these put together. Then we also look at, at having a heavy hand on the ocean. If one person can extract 86 ia one time one 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 harvest or one fishing expedition we ask is this a lot more than likely more than not i don't i don't know that we've ever had an answer no when we ask is this a lot of fish is 86 um what you guys seen and holding we usually have the students hold up all of these stringers and we make a big circle and we're like look around is this a lot nui keia plenty this is plenty fish 86 I yes it is so we're like well that's what you're taking out when you just take out her if you thinking 86 is a lot which we agree that is a lot plenty nui um that's what you're taking out when you take out one potentially 20 uh, our example here a 27 inch six-year-old omilu it's as if 
mehemela. It is as if you are taking out 86 two-year-olds. So again, we just ask all of us to rethink our actions, our choices, um, right? Is, is it really what we're gunning for, the big fish? And you know, if your answer is yes, we, we all are, are um, pri privileged to have our own manao, our own opinion, but we just want to offer information and that we hope perhaps if you can, or if any of us ha can see and realize our impact uh, and not all impact is positive not all impact is negative so just to find your place where are you in the choices that you make so one 27 inch six-year-old mama makes more babies than 86 14 year old um I mean, not 14 year old, sorry, two year old, 14 inch. And I do want to say, because a message came in from our lovely dear Nohea out in Kau, um, Palau, Palau Hulu. Let me look again, because I want to make sure that I'm saying your Ahupua are right, lovely Nohea. Uh, just want to say aloha and happy May Day to you folks. She had sent in a, a message, so I want to make sure. Yes, Palau Hulu, Ahupua Akau. How oli la me to you folks. Aloha nui no hea. Much aloha to you folks. Always, aloha. always. Um, anyhow, I'm not sure. We're kind of winding down. I'm watching the clock. We're at 10.23. We can either uh, I was wondering if anyone perhaps any entertain. Questions. Yeah, questions. If anyone have questions, you can um, unmute yourself or you can put it in the chat. Um, if you can't see the chat, there's a like a view tab that you can check that on. Uh, as as we might per perhaps be waiting for for some of those um, questions, if there's any, I'm not I'm not sure, but um, let's see. Oh, maybe some are. Do I have? Okay, sorry. I'm just looking. Thanks, Nahaku. Uh, just a little shout out for our upcoming, since we are kind of winding down before we perhaps run out of time, and maybe if I, I might forget, but uh, our next upcoming uh, Aloha Friday Live is going to actually have yet another uh, partnership. This time we're reaching Mauka to the Mauka lands, Mauka Pu'uwa Awa'a, uh, our lovely Liana is going to be joining myself uh we're gonna be really kind of looking at uh not just the ranching era but some of the stewardship efforts that kind of came within that time span of of the ranching era within our ahupua which kiholo resides in uh but nevertheless kind of maybe some some a thought that has come to my mind i don't have and we can push out for those of you nahaku let us know that we can um, send you things if you would so desire or you can just go to our kaupulehu again more partnerships here but our kaupulehu dryland lowland um, forest team we put out a uh, well several cards but one in particular that i would love to um, just speak about this is taking us back into traditional times within the North Kona landscape. And it's going to talk about the celebrated Aku and Opelu fishermen. So for us in North Kona, that's what um, those that that occupation, that Hana Lavaia, that occupation of fishing was really noted through these men who were Aku and Opelu fishermen, and it was right when one season one was on, what the other was off. Uh, the eye of the Aku was eaten by the Konohiki that opens your uh, Aku season, Opelu is closed. When Opelu season is open, Aku is closed. But here is a saying, and maybe I will try to um, put it up in chat so at least you know that. Uh, Nahaku or Sister Becca, how do, where, where's chat? I know I saw it earlier. Oh, there it is, chat. <laughs> I'm going to try and type something up, but I, if I click on it, where, where am I writing? I only see the big screen. Ah, 
it might be a sidebar off to the side. Um, I can write it in there too if you'd like. Oh, there you go. Okay, figured it out. Sorry, you guys. Um, I'm um, kind of learning as we go. Hola, Akula. Uh, and I don't know how to do Okina, I mean, uh, kahakos on this, so I'm uh, excuse me, Aina supposed to have a kahako. Hola, Akula, ka ina kaha, wapua, ka lehua, i kai. So there it is in Hawaiian. I hope you guys, oh yeah, there it is. Ola akulaka ena kaha uapua kalehua ikai. This is the translation. There is life in the kaha lands uh, when the lehua are seen upon the ocean. There is life in the kaha lands when the lehua are seen upon the ocean. So here's something to note. I, I want to, again, like Sister Becca said, right, we're expanding our mind. We always try to, I think it's a healthy thing in life to always expand our mind, expand our horizon, expand our, our thought, our thought patterns. Um, and um, so here's one. When Kupuna made this olelo noeo, or this uh, saying for the fishermen of North Kona, they were definitely referring to the Aku and the Opelu fishermen. Here's kind of a beautiful thing about our language, is that here's, here's this poetic essence that is found just um, permeating from the olelo maku ahine, our, our native language here. Lehua, when you see that word, uapua ka lehua ikai, that the lehua blossoms are seen out in the ocean, it does not by any means refer to the actual lehua flower that comes from the ohia tree. I will encourage you, like we did the last time, to, to look for these meanings on your own so that you yourself can see. But I will tell you, one of the meanings of lehua, when you do go and look uh, for its definitions, is um, a fisherman, an expert fisherman. So think of people that you might know, you yourself might be deemed by others or, or self-proclaimed, that's not bad too. But if you are a lehua or called uh, an, a lehua, you are an expert fisherman. And that's what this Olelo Noeo is talking about that there is life, life to the Kaha lands, which is a, a shortened term for Kekaha, Kekaha Vaiole, which is North Kona. So life to the Kaha lands when the expert fishermen, also known as Lehua, are seen in their canoes floating out in the ocean. Uh, so that, I think, just right to bring back that sort of ike as well, that kind of knowledge or that kind of, I can think of several people in my life that I would definitely deem alehua. And so I want to encourage us to perhaps bring these things back, not let them be fixed in the past, but look to those men and women who we know so ma'a to the kai, maybe fish their entire lives. And yes, indeed, they are lehua. Um, a poetic reference. Sure, we could be talking about the beautiful lehua mamo or the, lehua, the yellow lehua, the red lehua blossoms, but here in the context of fishing, of hanala vaita, to be a lehua means you are an expert fisherman. So just um, kind of my thoughts um, in closing is to all of the lehua out there, in the various communities, we honor you. We honor your, your mana'o, your ike, your knowledge, your wisdom, uh, particularly in fishing and for those traditions that are held within these lovely landscapes and, and families. Again, I just elevate those, um, those teachings, those ways, and let them um, inspire us to be the best stewards and, and to remember that the choices we make surely, surely, not just in fishing, but in per perhaps every aspect of our life. There are consequences, what we call hopena, some, some intended, some um, indirectly or directly, uh, you know, intended, but there are certainly consequences for our actions. And so to, to everyone out there that have joined, I want to say mahalo anui to you, Pekka, Nahaku, Lehua, everyone who's made this happen. Uh, and for each one of you joining, just kia aloha nui. Becca, any thoughts? Oh, mahalo kule. It was a pleasure to join you. Aloha Friday. Happy May Day. And I hope everyone's doing well. 
And next time, I hope that we can be together at the fish pond. Aloha. Indeed, indeed. I think something or oh, oh, Tita Lehua makes sense from, from Nohia, a message from Sister Nohia. Okay, well, everyone, here's our Aloha Friday Live. Join us on the 15th if you can. We're going to really focus in on ranching era and um, stewardship thereof, but just mahalo, 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 piha, remain safe and diligent, and just uh, from Hui Aloha Kiholo and the Nature Conservancy, all of us and our ohanas thereof, much, much um, happy aloha, may day, may day beautiful energies to you all. Ke aloha nui, ke aloha nui, akako, ahui ho, ahui ho, ahui ho. Oh, aloha.